So let me welcome everyone on our weekly seminar. So our guest today is Gemma de las Cuevas from the University of Innsbruck. Let me say a few words about Gemma. So she did her PhD in 2011 with Hans Briegel at the University of Innsbruck. Then she did two postdocs. The first one was at MPQ in Garching. And it was uh, a long one. And uh, the other one was at the Perimeter Institute, okay, a shorter one. Then from 2016, she's back to, to the University of, uh, of Innsbruck. And Gemma uh, has a lot of very interesting papers. So let me mention the, um, the one about spin systems uh, and uh, the universality uh, published in science together with Toby Qubit, or the other one about uh, energy of spin systems as an um, indicator of non-locality of the systems. Okay, written. Very famous paper. Published with you, published with you. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't want to say that. Okay, and uh, the title of today's talk is Quantum Theory from the Whole to the Parts, Magic Squares and Shadows of Infinity. Okay, so the microphone is yours, Gemma. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Um, I love to be with you here, even if um, only virtually. So, um, yeah, so I'd like to share with you some of our recent work uh, that we've been doing in our group in the more mathematical direction, uh, which has to do with some investigations of some aspects of quantum theory, which I've grouped around the topic of from the whole to the parts, magic squares and shadows of infinity. So, um, um, science is really a teamwork, and I'm very fortunate to be part of this team. Um, of, uh, in particular, like Sebastian Stengler, Joshua left the group. Uh, he was a master's student, Toby Reinhardt, Andreas Klingler, and Mirte van der Eyden. And now we also have Tomás Gonda with us. He's a postdoc coming from the Perimeter Institute. And um, I've also had the, the luck and the pleasure of working recently in, in, in recent years with Tim Netzer very closely, uh, who is a professor for algebra here at the University of Innsbruck. And it's just great fun working with him. We've collaborated very much. And um, also very much with Tom, who is a postdoc in Tim's group. He's also a mathematician. And yeah, I'm just very thankful and grateful for, for this um, ongoing collaboration. And so today's talk will be about this line of research, um, these mathematical physics topics, which can be um, kind of put under the headline of positivity structures in quantum many body systems. Um, this is led by Andreas and Mirte, who are both PhD students officially in my group, but we all work very closely together with Tim. This was a topic of my habilitation. I don't know if that's a thing in Poland, but here in Austria, people still do this habilitation. Mm -hmm. And I also did it. We do. We you do as well. Mm -hmm. It's a little weird because actually it's a bit mixed, the system here. So kind of newer, newly appointed professors don't really have to do it, but some others do. So I think it's a bit of a mixture. Anyway, I did it. Um, and this was kind of the topic or part of the topic of my habilitation. And it will be the topic of today's talk. But there's another line of research also in my group, which is getting uh, more and more important, which has to do with universality and undecidability everywhere, as I like to call it. Um, yeah, this was granted a start prize, which here in Austria is kind of a big thing, or like, yeah, it's, it's quite a lot of money. And Toby, Sebastian, and Tomas are in this project. And if you want to know more, maybe you may want to have a look at the TEDx talk I gave recently. It's a 14-minute talk where I try to explain what we're trying to understand. <laughs> um, yeah, to everyone in, in, in 14 minutes, I did my best. Um, yeah, that may be a good start um, if you're interested in, in, in that thing. But today, let's talk about that. And to that end, I'd like to start by imagining the relation between quantum physics, understood as experimental quantum physics, and the theory of quantum physics. Um, with this artwork by Kumi Yamashita. Um, so this relation is, the relation between the abstract world and the physical world is very mysterious to me. I don't understand it at all. Unfortunately, I will have nothing to say about that. Uh, but yeah, so, so, so here on, on the left-hand side on physics, we have some sort of events and, and repetitions of these events, which lead to relative frequencies. 
and which only in some limit would lead to some probability. So I think limits are not physical, uh, but, but anyway, that's what we would have here. And I would like to highlight four aspects of the theory of quantum physics that on which we will shed light from some angle, I believe, or I, we will try. One are non-commutative spaces. The other is a tensor product as the fundamental compositional structure. The third one are, is the role played by positive elements, which of course play a distinguished role in this theory. And the fourth one are complex amps. So let me go into each of these aspects. Oh. And somewhere in the middle, there is the measurement problem, which I don't understand at all. I think it's fair to say I don't understand quantum physics. Um, I can do the maths, but I don't understand what's going on. Anyway, but that, that would be a topic of, for another talk. <laughs> okay, so, so, so let, me, let me talk about the maths, which is kind of easier, okay? So non-commutativity, I would argue, leads to a new universe in the sense that classical physics is like being at level one of a certain universe and discovering quantum physics is like um, going to higher levels of that universe. In this sense, it, discovering quantum physics is like discovering a new universe. So the level here is something like the internal dimension of your system. So for example, a mixed state, a qubit, is represented by a two by two matrix. So that it would be at level two of this universe. Okay, and the kind of the higher the level, the, 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 high, the, the higher the internal dimension of your system. And uh, classical physics would correspond to the commutative case, say to level one. Uh, this view is very much influenced by the connection to free semi-algebraic geometry with, um, with Tim Netzer, who very much um, kind of emphasizing, emphasizes this perspective. Um, but I think that this view also highlights the role of non-commutativity because all of these levels are represented by matrix spaces, which are and, and their product, which is non-commutative. It only becomes commutative in, a, in, in the level one case. Um, sorry, Jim, I, I wanted to just understand like the, on the uh, vertical act, uh, on the yeah, back, vertical axis, you have dimension essentially. Or, yeah. Okay, so you associate, let's say that the higher the dimension, the higher the like non, Commutativity, in a sense, right? Uh, it's like the yeah, it's like the internal dimension of, of your system. Okay. Yeah, so like a, a Q trip would be like at level three. Yeah. Okay. Now the second aspect is the tensor product, which gives rise to a new compositional universe, and um, the compositional rule is as fundamental as the um, description of single systems. And I think it is a misconception of reductionism to overestimate the importance of single systems. So in this case, if we have two quantum systems and we want to describe their composition, we do so with the tensor product. And we physicists like to imagine the tensor product as something like um, we pick an um, orthonormal basis for the first universe and then we attach to every element of that basis a whole copy of the second universe. This view is very basis dependent, not very elegant. And in fact, I've only very recently learned that to define the tensor product properly, one needs some category theory, um, some universal properties of category theory and so on. So it's not particularly simple or straightforward to do so. And many of the complications that will appear later on come from, um, from the definition of the tensor product because it's so important. In particular, um, a given element in this composite space um, has a highly non-unique decomposition as a sum of elements in this space tensor this space. The third aspect is that part of this universe is positive. And that's very important. Uh, these positive elements play a very important role and interact in a very non-trivial way with the composition rule. So positive elements define some sort of a, well, define a cone. Because a cone means that um, you can scale, if you, if you are in, in this set, you can multiply it with a positive um, number and you will still be in the set. Um, so 
but not with a negative number, not necessarily. So it is different from a vector space. So like the underlying universe is a vector space, is a matrix space, which is easier to characterize because it has a finite basis. This cone lives in a finite dimensional vector space, but its, its walls are um, round. So to characterize the cone, you need like an infinite set of extremal rays. Okay? So it's more difficult to characterize the cone than the vector space. Um, well, in particular, I should say that if you intersect, so actually we care about, for every dimension, we care about the convex set. It's not only a convex cone because the trace needs to be one as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of close, but the difficulty about the infinite description that I just mentioned remains. And um, of course, if we have two side systems, each with its own cone, then the composite system is gonna have its own cone. Okay, that's kind of the cone of the, so the set of positive semi-definite elements on the composite system. Now, as you know, so how does this cone relate to the other two cones? Well, not in an easy way. Um, first of all, of course, the tensor product is not, tensor product of the cones is not the resulting cone because the tensor product interacts well with vector spaces, but not with cones. And the convex combination of um, the Cartesian product of elements of this cone and this other cone is not that cone either. That would only give us the separable elements. And here there are entangled elements as well. So overall, it's a very rich structure. Uh, so this interplay between cones and the multiplicity of systems is very rich. And I always like to imagine this, um, well, or imagine living in this world of, of Escher, who through this wonderful lithograph, and it's called convex and concave, and it's full of paradoxes, which ultimately come from the fact that uh, from, come from the interaction between convexity and the multiplicity of systems. And of course, convexity comes from the notion of positivity. So I take this lithograph as a, as a metaphor for the richness of the landscape that we are exploring. And the final aspect is that this universe is complex. That's also something very weird, I think. Um, you know, complex numbers were invented as a, as a as a mental game, who would have thought that the square root of minus one would have any importance whatsoever? I mean, let alone play a fundamental role in one of the most, in one of the deepest theories of our world, right? Um, so to, so, and, and, and it is important that, that these vector spaces are complex vector spaces. They are not real vector spaces with a simple, and you can see that with a simple parameter counting. Um, for the set of positive semi-definite matrices. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so to each such universe, there's like a real and an imaginary part. And um, when you combine them, you compose them, they mix in, in the right way. And, and the imaginary numbers do all the job of, of, of mixing in the real and the imaginary parts uh, in, in the right way. And so, I like to imagine. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry uh, Gemma, yeah. I didn't get this last part. So, what do you kind of, yeah, like what do you mean by by this? Like, I so so sort of I I, I like you know if you take uh, just a simple example, you know, some purely imagined. I know that's like the complex structure. It's basis depend. Uh, it's basis dependent. So you know you can pick some basis of your vector space, and then you can build. Uh, like a real vector space from, from it, right? And then when you multiply by complex numbers, you'll have like imaginary part. I, I, and I guess this is what you mean here, kind of Victoria. I mean, okay, at least this is how I got what, what you were saying. And now if you take tensor product of two purely imaginary, uh, so my question is like, what do you mean that they compose in the right way uh, those? So because like when I take, Two purely imaginary, let's say, pure, yeah, maybe it's, yeah, like what do you mean by this? I'm, I'm confused, sorry. Yeah. So, and um, every complex vector space can be split into a real and an imaginary part. So, from this perspective, it seems like there's nothing 
really fundamental going on with the complex numbers, right? It's just like, they seem like two copies of the real numbers. But actually, this splitting does not combine well with the tensor product. This is the, this is the problem. And another way of seeing that is uh, by a simple parameter counting. If you count the number of parameters of, a, of positive semi-definite matrices over the complex numbers, um, it's kind of the right number so that the composition works. Uh, you can easily see that, uh, and it's not the right number if they were defined over the reals. So, uh, okay, let me see. So if you have a D times D complex matrix, which is positive semi-definite, you can count that it has D squared free real parameters. And so if you have a DS times DS matrix, like positive semi-definite matrix, it has DS squared um, real parameters, which is like D squared times um, S squared real parameters. This doesn't work if you're like over the reals. Uh, and yeah, and, and a further comment that maybe helps explain my point, um, like when you study interference or so, it's so beautifully defined by complex numbers and, and described by it. And it still surprises me that they are so useful for us. Why? Um, as I said, they, they were invented as a, a product of imagination to solve certain equations, like polynomial equations, x squared equals, my, equals minus one. Yeah, I, I find it sure. like another puzzling aspect or surprising or non-trivial aspect of, of this theory. Yeah, and so, okay, my metaphor here was that when these um, universes are combined, the imaginary parts are, are mixed and the real part, yeah, they are mixed, right? You know how to combine complex numbers um, in, in, in a way which kind of makes me think of some novels which combine fiction and, and reality and maybe in a wonderful way and maybe the, the, the maximum exponent of that or, or one superlative example would be like the Don Quixote de la Mancha, I don't know if you've read it, uh, but um, kind of the fiction and reality is all combined in a like a wonderfully tangled way and it, it reminds me of what's going on in, in combining the description of single systems in quantum mechanics. So um, uh, I'm, I'm considering these four aspects of the theory of um, quantum physics non-commutativity, the tensor product, positive elements and complex numbers. And I will try to shed light on, on the interactions among these elements through our projects. So the first one has to do with from the whole to the parts, um, which really touches on these three aspects. The second one has to do with quantum magic squares, which mainly touches on positivity and non-commutativity. And the third one has to do with shadows of infinity, which in particular challenges the use of complex numbers and replaces it with so-called hyper-complex numbers. You've probably never heard of hyper-complex numbers. They are not like quaternions. They are rather um, a complex version of hyper-real numbers, which are something like another crazy product of imagination, but which allows us to solve some old like all standing problems in quantum information theory, such as the existence of NPP bound entanglement. Okay, so let me start with from the whole to the parts. And yeah, so um, but I'd love to illustrate this with this amazing painting by Dali of Gala. Gala was his muse with his, his wife as well. Um, the relation between the whole and its parts is a I guess a uh, classical topic in metaphysics. Um, and um, quantum theory, of course, gives us very surprising relations among the whole and the parts, like a maximally entangled state. You have perfect knowledge of the whole and perfect lack of knowledge, maximal lack of knowledge of the parts. This is really unique. And I wish that all philosophers knew about that because it's, a, it's very surprising. Um, I would, however, like to study this relation between the whole and the parts in a more general way for tensor product structures. And let me just say one more thing, which has nothing to do with what's coming, but I just love it. Um, the only thing whose whole can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with its parts is infinity. 
right? Like um, it's almost a defining property of infinity. Um, I will have nothing to say about the infinity, unfortunately, but um, maybe our work can be extended um, toward um, studying infinite families of, of state and, and things like that. Okay? But um, it will all be finite from now on. So I'd like to, I'll be guided by the following questions. The first one is, how do the parts form the whole? This is the most important question, and it will kind of set um, our framework. The second one, we'll be able to address with the framework of the first question. And it has to do with the question, if the whole is invariant, so if, it has, if the whole has some properties, such as invariants under a certain group, are the parts invariant too? So it can be, can this property be kind of pushed into the parts so that the parts contain a certificate of this property of the whole? The third one asks, if the whole is positive, for some notion of positivity, and there are various notions, um, can this property be pushed to the parts as well? So do the parts need to be positive as well? In fact, we will combine positivity and invariance. And our main theorems will address these questions. The fourth one asks, what happens if the parts only approximate the whole? And the conclusions change very much. If the parts only give rise to a, something which is epsilon close to the whole, then, then things change a lot. And the, the fifth question asks, what about other worlds with the same parts whole relation, in other words, with the same composition structure? more particularly um, multivariate polynomials. We will apply the entire framework we have developed, in, which is inspired by tensors and quantum physics to multivariate polynomials. Okay, how do the parts form the whole? What are the parts? The parts are vector spaces, V1 and V2, like two universes. The whole is the composite system, Going from the parts to the whole is the easy direction. That is called composition. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, can you see that? Okay. okay. Now, I will now consider, when I say the whole, I will consider an element in this composite system, little v, which you can imagine as a star in this composite universe, living in v1 tensor v2. And we will be interested in decomposing it into its parts. This is the inverse problem of composition and it's generally a lot more complicated. Well, obviously, because this lives in a vector, uh, in a tensor product space, this can be expressed as the sum of some elements in the first um, vector space, tensor element in the second vector space, um, a alpha, B alpha, and this uh, summation index alpha runs from one to R. So this can be represented as something like an element here times an element here. This is in fact some sort of, in fact, like Cartesian product. Anyway, um, yeah, times the same for alpha equals two, blah, blah, blah. And um, this is usually represented by, so the set of A alphas, for running alpha is a tensor. It's a vector, if you want, whose components are A1, A2, A3, and so on. And, and you can represent it by something like a dot and, a, and an open leg. This open leg is representing the alpha and the same with a B uh, and the open leg, the alpha. And so the contraction of this leg is represented by, by uh, the contraction of so the sum over alpha is represented by a contraction of the leg so that this leg is no longer open. So this decomposition is often represented by a segment. Now, this uh, decomposition is highly non-unique. This is one of the problems of entanglement, one of the ways of expressing the problem of entanglement, if you want. But R is unique. So the minimal such R is well defined. It is the rank. It's the uh, number of linearly independent elements on the left-hand side, which is the same as the number of linearly independent elements on the right-hand side. And of, 
it is impossible to overstate the importance of the rank across natural and mathematical sciences. Uh, moreover, we are in lack because it is easy to compute. And moreover, we can state, we know that V is a sterile concatenation of its parts. So the whole is a sterile concatenation of its parts if and only if this rank is one, namely it is of this form. So, it is, so a higher R is a measure of how different V is from a sterile concatenation of its parts. Now, this is a very unstable and non-robust measure of this fact, right? Because the epsilon close to a rank one thing, there are rank n things, um, but it, this is nonetheless true. But my main message is that the simplicity of two parts is an accident of the number two and does not carry over to three parts. And we have multiple examples of this. Uh, maybe if you're a bit familiar with computational complexity theory with two sad and three sad, there is a sudden jump in complexity. Well, for tensors, I believe the same, the same is essentially going on. This very simple situation is misleading. It's only an accident of the, of the bipartite case. The general situation is way richer and more complex. So consider the multipartite case. You have multiple parts, say n parts, n vector spaces, and you have uh, the whole is their tensor product. As usual, we will consider an element in this tensor product, some sort of a star, and we want to decompose it. Now, if you ask, if you pose this question to a mathematician, I think that virtually all of them will give you this decomposition. Now, this is the so-called tensor rank decomposition, where you have a joint index among all of the parts, which run from one to R. So this could be represented by something like that. Note that it, it wasn't entirely clear how I was supposed to draw this graph. And it's very non-accidental, the fact that I've chosen to, um, to paint the intermediate, like the, the, the phase in the middle, because this alpha is an index shared by the three of them, right? So how, what, so, so single edges do not suffice. Um, yeah, so this R is called a tensor rank. It's hard to compute. And in this case, we have that V is a sterile concatenation of its parts if R equals one, but the converse is not true, right? Because um, two parts could be completely disconnected, but the others could be connected. And so R would be larger than one, but nonetheless, part one and part two would be in a sterile concatenation. So if you want to characterize the whole in terms of like the parts whole relation, the tensor rank does not suffice. Emma, can I have a question here? Yeah. So this, this R, this tensor rank is a, it's a concrete number, no? Associated to, well, to this vector. Yeah, it's a natural number. So, so kind. okay, so here, I can consider another decomposition in which alpha is like a multi-index, okay, which consists of many indices, and then this R will be different, no? So you have to apply some. So, for instance, in the, the previous case where you have like uh, bipartite systems, it was just the Schmidt decomposition, I guess, no? Yeah. So now this this R is uh, well, you have I mean you have to impose some constraints on the like this matrices, these vectors A, B, and, and so on. So far, I have no constraints, but that's true. I, we could go in the direction of these multi-ranks, but that's mm -hmm. not the direction we chose to go. So give me half a minute and you'll see where, where I'm going. But it's an interesting question how it relates to the multi-ranks, okay? Thank you for your question and I'll, I'll make sure to think about that. Okay, so the parts can, so my story here is that the parts can, form the whole in many other ways. And not only that, but for physics, this tensor rank is not relevant. In particular for describing famously spin chains, um, you care about indices that are summed in a way that reflect the physical interactions. So they would typically have um, a one-dimensional structure or a two-dimensional structure, but not, uh, the tensor rank is the worst you can do. I mean, we, we showed it as well. <laughs> it's like the most expensive ranks, rank of them all. So let me explain that. Okay. 
So you could you could connect them in a line. I, I come from Tender Networks, from Matrix Product State, from Matrix Product Operators. So of course that, that that's very natural to me. Um, yeah, so in this case, you would have multiple indices. Alpha one, for example, is shared between the first part and the second part, as you can see. Alpha two is shared between the second part and the third part here, and so on. And each of them would run from one to R. And this R is called the operator's mid rank. I don't think any mathematician knows about that, more or less. This is relevant for the description of 1D systems with open boundary conditions in particular via tensor networks. Actually, in mathematics, they have something called tensor trains. I think they independently discovered the, um, I think it has, the, the MPS at least have been independently discovered like at least three times or so, I think, or like by Vidal, but in the finitely correlated states, then again by Ignacio and Frank and Norbert and David, and um, in the tensor trains and, and so, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah. Or, or they could be connected, the parts could be connected in a circle, where the only difference is that there is additionally here an index alpha n that's connecting part one and part n. So this would be relevant for 1D systems with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and clear a priori what this R is and how it relates to the tensor rank and to the operator Schmidt rank. I mean, it could be figured out that there's no one big framework. I'm trying to introduce this framework, of course. Um, or they could be connected like that in some other way. For example, here, part one and two share the index alpha, part two, three, and four share the index beta, and part five, part four and five share the index gamma. These should be related to your multi ranks, I think, uh, that Remy was asking. But I haven't thought about that, but I guess I should. <laughs> okay. So, or wait, or wait, they, they could be connected doubly. And this is important for the case with symmetry, like a double edge connection. How can all these decompositions be expressed? Um, this is what we answered. Um, well, we addressed this question in one particular way in this paper. And um, we um, um, proposed the following framework. We represent every part by a vertex. And which of these vertices come together is represented by a multi hypergraph omega. Now, you probably all know what a graph is. A hypergraph is like a graph where you can have hyper edges, which means like a facet, for example, a hyper edge between three um, vertices or between four vertices. Um, multi means that. Uh, these hyper edges can have multiplicity. For example, you could have a double edge. And okay, in um, fact, sorry, can I can I ask about this? So so is it like sort of like a one can imagine maybe you weighted hypergraph, and this multi hypergraph would be weighted hypergraph, where the weights would be just integers or something like this. Is yeah. That... Thanks for okay, your question. Okay. Actually. Um, Actually, I think that I thought that multi hypergraph sounds friendlier to physicists, but what we actually do is we use weighted simplicial complexes, which are like multi hypergraphs with some uh, well behaved condition that um, if a facet is included in a larger facet, then the multiplicity of the smaller must divide the multiplicity of the larger. Yeah, so it's a technically it's a weighted simplicial. Um, complex, but in fact, we never use this well behaved condition. But I was convinced by Tim that it's just nicer to do it this way. Apparently, for mathematicians, weighted simplicial complexes sound way more natural and less scary than multi hypergraphs. But maybe because of where I come from, how I've been brought up, multi hypergraphs sound quite natural. I don't know. Yeah. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even. You did more than answering my question, but that's, yeah. Okay, good. And then uh, the summation indices of the decomposition are placed on the facets of omega. So this is the use of omega. It represents where the summation indices are. And this gives rise to a so-called omega decomposition. 
and the minimal number of terms is called the omega rank of that element. For example, the tensor rank decomposition corresponds to the case when omega is um, the full simplex. And the tensor rank is, a, is the rank omega where omega equals the simplex. Um, the, um, the 1D decomposition with periodic boundary conditions corresponds to the case when omega is a graph, which is a circle. Yeah, and the omega rank is well, the, the corresponding minimal number of terms. Uh, this is another omega. This is another decomposition and the minimal number of terms didn't have a name before. And this is another decomposition. In this case, um, omega is a graph with two edges and a double edge among them. And again, there will be some minimal number of terms. Okay, what is this? Can I, can I have a question? Yeah. So while I understand uh, like the three, the second, the third, and the fourth example, I don't understand the first one because you have five vertices in the graph. Yeah. And four elements in the tensor product. Oh, I made a mistake in the drawing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can promise you, I looked at this like 10 times and I never saw that difference. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> but ceramic is ceramic, you know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Has, Unless... No, that was supposed to be complement ceramic, really. Like it's sorry. Yeah. Unless we are in some very fancy world where four equals five. That would be very unsettling, though. But, uh... Thanks for your question. I mean, you could have been imagining that I was assuming something really weird, like four equals five. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Any more mistakes? All right. Okay, now, what can we do with this framework? Well, we can address question two and three, and then four and five. If the whole is invariant, are the parts invariant too? What does this mean? We say that an element V is G invariant, where G is a group, if G times V equals V for all elements in the group. What does G times V mean? I think I have an example. Okay. G times V is a permutation of the parts of V. For example, imagine that G is a cyclic permutation. Then, so that big G is the cyclic group, then this would give, then this means that, that V is translationally invariant. Or imagine that big G is the whole permutation group. Then this means that this big B is permutationally invariant. Okay, now what, do, what does it mean that the parts are invariant? Okay, I'll show you in a second. It means that they have some sort of local certificate of that invariance. Okay. The most important example, again, is the so-called symmetric decomposition, where all, haha, so here you cannot see if there are four or five parts. So, so <laughs> all elements are the same. It's I, A alpha, A alpha, A alpha, A alpha. Now, this is what I call a local certificate of the global invariance, because if V admits this decomposition, then clearly, V is SN symmetric, where, or SN invariant, where SN is the full symmetry group, right? By the way, the minimal such R is called the symmetric tensor rank. And that's like, a, you may have heard that this has been very recently very studied in maths. And there was this conjecture that the tensor rank would be called the symmetric tensor rank. It's called the common conjecture, and then which was disproven by Shitov um, a couple of years ago in a pretty amazing counterexample. Yeah, it's a symmetric tensor. Um, or you could, th th that's very important for translational invariant matrix product states. Right? Or they, there could be like a circle decomposition where you can again see that A is the same everywhere. Now A alpha, beta, beta, gamma, gamma, delta, and so on. And um, again, it is apparent from this decomposition that if you apply a translation by one cyclic translation, this thing is left unchanged, so V is invariant. So that, that's, this is what I mean when I say that the parts are invariant. The, this decomposition makes it explicit that V is translationally invariant. 
this decomposition makes it explicit that V is permutationally invariant. Yeah, and by the way, this R is called a translationally invariant operator Schmidt graph. Yeah. So what this means is that each local tensor is G invariant. And there is a formal definition in the paper, but since I didn't define formally the omega G decomposition, oh, I don't have a G yet. Yeah, I'm gonna have a G in a second. Um, it, 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 there's a formal definition, but this is the idea that each local tensor has some sort of G invariance. Yeah. So it means that if you take a local tensor at site I and look at the index beta, you can shift in the beta by, um, by, um, by the group action G and at the same time change the site. So I becomes GI and the two things are the same. Okay. So an omega decomposition where the local tensors are G invariant is called an omega G decomposition. And the minimal number of terms is called the omega G rank. Now, if the, if V has an omega G decomposition, then V is G invariant. This is the easy direction. And this is so by construction. The central question of our paper was, if B is G invariant, does it admit an omega G decomposition? And when or under which conditions? Uh, sorry, sorry, Gemma, can I can you go back a bit? Just um, so I, I, I want to understand the act, like because I understood very well on examples when you were talking about permutation invariance or translational invariance. But like abstractly, I don't understand this action of the symmetry group on parts, right? So do you, I guess you don't assume that like, uh, I mean, where the group acts, like is that, does it act on vector space, let's say individual vector space, or does it act in some sp the space of this indices? Yeah, I, uh, like yeah. clarify. Yeah. We have a set of indices from one to N, which label the parts. Or la label the local vector spaces, and G acts there. For example, okay, I see, I see. Thanks. So, so it acts in the just as some subgroup of the permutation group. Yeah. Of this. Thanks. So it's only an external symmetry of V. It is not. We are not considering um, like internal symmetries. For example, when if every a uh, local degree of freedom is U1 invariant or SU2 invariant. These are not part of our framework. Yeah, gotcha, thanks. Okay, so that's a central question. If V is G invariant, does it have an omega G decomposition? That is, can the invariants of the whole be pushed to the parts? And our theorem says, yes. And it gives a sufficient condition if G acts freely on omega. I'm sure you don't understand what freely means because we defined it. <laughs> so this is a condition of the group action on the, um, so a condition of how G acts on omega. It, it's not so insightful now to define freeness, but this perhaps more interesting is another proposition which says that the multiplicity of the facets of omega can always be increased so that this condition is met. Okay. So in other words, um, you can always, so if, an, if V is G invariant, it does admit an omega G decomposition if omega has enough multiplicity in its facets. Okay, that's, that's our main kind of result. We have another existence theorem when G's action is blending, which is something else that we define, which um, expresses, it doesn't give rise to an omega G decomposition, but the sub, it subtracts two omega G decompositions. Doesn't matter. Okay, and this allows us to compare ranks when changing either omega or G and prove, for example, that the largest rank is the tender rank, not surprisingly and many more results. Okay, now I, I wanna address question three. If the whole is positive, are the parts positive too? What does, this, what does it mean that the whole is positive? It means that V is in a cone. 
Now it could be two possible cones. The cone of, I, well, you are all quantum physicists, I think. So you're probably used to the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. But it could also be the cone of entry-wise non-negative matrices. This is what it is, entry-wise non-negative matrices. It's literally, I think it's a vector notion of positivity, which you are putting like in a matrix. But these things are, are ugly. They don't even need to be square matrices or, um, yeah, or Hermitian or symmetric or anything. They're literally entry-wise non-negative. It's another cone. It's also a cone because if you multiply by a, by five, a non-negative matrix, it's still a non-negative matrix, right? So it could mean either of these two things. Okay. Okay, what, what does this mean? Well, this could mean three things as far as I'm concerned. The first one is that is the what we call a separable decomposition, which means that the parts are in the same cone as the whole. For example, if V is positive semi-definite, then each of the local terms needs to be positive semi-definite. Or if the whole, if the uh, co if the whole is entry-wise non-negative, then each of the local things needs to be non-negative. This is called the non-negative factorization. Okay. This gives rise to a so-called a separable omega G decomposition. Is an omega G decomposition where every okay here I took this particular case where every local term is positive semi-definite. And this gives rise to the so-called separable rank, omega G separable rank. But it could mean something else. In a purification, it means that you take a certificate that V is in that cone and you decompose that certificate. Um, so like, so an omega G decomposition, omega G purification of V is an omega G decomposition of a certificate of V. So of an L with the property that L dagger L is V. I think if there are mathematicians in the audience, dagger means star. And for the physicist, this product is the same as tracing over the auxiliary indices of a pure state. Trace over the auxiliary indices is like the internal dimension here that's being summed. Um, sorry, Jenna, I got a bit Loss. So, so this because we are like, I mean, let's say what you are saying is actually very, very beautiful and very inspiring to me. Just I, I was under the impression that we are talking mostly about, let's say, abstract, uh, uh, largely about abstract uh, vector spaces, right? Uh, now and uh, now there is this purification uh, coming in. So, I mean, for quantum physicists, it's like you have, you think of mixed state and then you have some purification of it, right? So, uh, okay, specifically there is this omega G purification, what this means, like, so do you want the purification to, to have the similar, so you probably take, I know, two copies of your, uh, Kind of uh, simplicial complex or whatever, and you wanted to have like similar track, like it's uh, it's omega g uh, purification. So would you require also kind of the simplicial complex to kind of be present in this purification uh, and uh, also g acting there? I'm a bit kind of uh, confused here. Yeah. So imagine that v is a one-dimensional mixed state. Then a purification is um, a one-dimensional pure state, priori, right? And the fact that um, it is one-dimensional, this is kind of the omega in, in your L. So this L is like the, the pure state on top, which you're gonna take a copy uh, uh, underneath, okay? And, and well, this will have a rank, right? Again, the minimal number of terms of that, that's called the purification rank usually. Um, but moreover, you could ask for um, this decomposition to be translationally invariant. So this would, G here would be the cyclic group. And um, this would be asking that your pure state is itself of the form A, 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 A. Does this help? Uh... Yes, that's so, so in a sense, you require, let's say, also the purification. I, I, I guess you can define those things 
sort of maybe with regards to the, to those cones, but let's say for the sec, uh, yeah, so so you you require the purification to to have the same symmetries and the, uh, as underlying state. Basically, this is the uh, I mean not only the state, but you also want to right. I mean you also would like to have for it the decomposition that mimics the structure of this omega, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you're, you're literally um, looking for an omega g decomposition of L, not of V anymore, just of L, of the certificate. And as you're pointing out, well, you didn't say that explicitly, but I think you were thinking of it. This is highly non unique, right? This decomposition is highly non unique. So that's already hinting at the fact that that's going to be a lot harder because, for example, the Omega G, the um, omega G rank is going to contain a minimization over all um, such certificates. It's going to be the minimum um, purific, uh, omega G rank of L, where L has the property that L dagger L is V. But I think this is more generally an idea which, in my experience, algebraic, um, algebraists find quite natural that what is a what a positive element in an algebra something that can be written as a squared something like that you know and so you so in some sense it is natural to to take um to take that step toward uh that certificate or toward that that proof that that element is positive because this puts you on safe grounds i mean you can only take that step if the whole is positive and then you ask for the uh, composition of that certificate or of that, of that. Well, really, it's exactly what we do in quantum physics. I mean, it's exactly this if you want the local purification form for one d mixed states or for two d states. It's, it's exactly the, like the, the idea of the two approaches. Yeah. Because in the MPO, in the MPO form, you don't have any local certificate of the global positive. Okay, or another one that's usually omitted in the quantum physics literature, but that's been a bit studied in the maths literature is a quantum square root. We call it this way, quantum square root um, decomposition, which is like a purification, but with a restriction that the parts, that the certificate be Hermitian. So, um, so an omega g quantum square root, I'm sorry for the many definitions, is an omega g decomposition of L where V is L squared. And uh, this gives rise to the quantum square root rank. Okay, why am I mentioning all of these ranks? Because there are separations among all of these. So each of them can be a lot harder than the previous one. Okay, so that's our kind of the main theorem. If the whole is positive, are the parts positive too? Theorem, yes. You can make the parts positive in the way we define, but generally for a large price, meaning there are separations among all the ranks. Okay, how do we know that? I'm glossing over that a little bit fast, but I'm trying to give you the gist of the of the work. Or I guess I'm mainly trying to convey to you the questions and get you interested in the questions. Okay, now how do we know that? Well, if V has two parts it's bipartite, and G is their permutation, which is the only non-trivial thing you can do with two parts. And moreover, V is the cone of non-negative numbers. Then it turns out that our fancy things, <laughs> like decompositions, correspond to well-studied decompositions. The separable one becomes the completely positive decomposition. The purification becomes the so-called completely positive semi-definite, CPSD, this is called CP. And this thing becomes a square root decomposition. And there are separations among these already. So from here, we inherit kind of the separations for the more general case. Intuitively, many more things should happen for this quantum and more general case, but I don't, it's too difficult for me. I don't know how to prove this, okay? I don't have the tools to really explore all this space. All I can say for the moment is the easy thing that all of these separations are inherited here. Okay, by the way, that says that our, and um, generalizations are in some way sensible. Okay, what if the parts now only approximate the whole? What does that mean? It means that they 
give rise to an, they are in an epsilon ball around V. I can imagine something like that measured in some norm, some Shatten P norm that's gonna matter. They are all kind of equivalent in finite dimensions. And, and, and then we, we, the epsilon rank is gonna be the smallest rank of an element in the epsilon ball. And that gives rise to a flurry of ranks with an additional epsilon up there, which is like the minimum of in the epsilon ball. Actually, we're gonna have an extra P up there that's telling us in what norm we are measuring that epsilon ball. So it's like looking at this picture by Escher with a finite resolution and asking what happens. And what happens is that many of the separations disappear. That's something new that, uh, uh, and this is mainly due to a new, something we learned recently from team called the approximate Cartesian theorem that holds for certain norms for certain intervals of the norms. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot of room for improvement. I'm not, <laughs> not going into any of the details here. Um, for example, in this whole paper, we don't use the tender product structure of this thing. I think there's a lot of, lot of room for improvement in the approximate cases, but that's what we could do so far. So Gemma, can I ask, so you, you mentioned that it doesn't matter, like that separations disappear uh, when you give yourself this upside of a room uh, and you mentioned that, yeah, the what norm you're using does matter because all the norms in finite dimensional spaces are equivalent, but sort of uh, in, in, in practice, uh, like for, let's say for some application, okay, for applications, there, there is huge difference between different norms, right? Well, thank, thanks for your question. I have two comments. The first is that actually we can only prove the theorem for a funny interval of P in the Schatten P norms, which goes from one, not including one, so it doesn't hold for the trace norm to, I think it's to two and then, or like there's some, there's some, some fraction there, like there's some, some missing segment and then all the rest. And that missing segment is because we use some Hölder inequality, which we don't know if it might hold in that middle thing. It might, but a completely different chapter, I think is the trace norm. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why I was saying that there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, I think the whole paper is, so it's giving precise upper bounds on all of these epsilon ranks as a function of P as well, where P is, um, but it never exploits the, um, the tensor product structure of the thing. And it should, because that's in some sense, that's the whole story. That's the whole story I've been telling, right? That the tensor product structure is so important. So far, we've only, we're have only only using this tool, this approximate Cartesian theorem that tells you um, that if you have an element in a convex set and you can approximate it um, in a way which is independent of the ambient dimension. And so because of that, it follows that the separations disappear because there's always like an upper bound in terms of the ambient dimension. Um, but yeah, so the results are very abstract and we also try to make it, to make them more um, attractive for quantum information or like for 1D and so on. We tried to specialize there, but we got, we really didn't, we got a bit stuck and we left it in the middle. So maybe if you're interested, we can chat more about that. Okay, let me go on. What about other worlds with the same parts hold that relation? And this means the tensor product and worlds means polynomials, multivariate polynomials, uh, which are constructively. So, so these are like real polynomials here in multiple variables, multiple variables. So there are N of these and there are N such worlds. And we applied our entire machinery here. We defined omega g decompositions of polynomials separable and some of squares versions with invariants proved existence theorems of uh, invariant polynomials, inequalities changing omega or g, inequalities and separations between the ranks, disappearance in the proximate case, yeah. and undecidability of a polynomial problem by linking it to an undecidability of, um, of matrix product operators. I think this is, um, this is something that may be of interest mainly for mathematicians. Um, but it's, I think it's a nice interface among walls because this comes, this is all inspired by our tensor by tensors, yeah. Okay, change of topic. Am I, how am I doing in time? Horribly, right? How much time do I have, Remy? 
Well, this depends on you. How much time do you need? So we are kind of flexible. Two more, maybe 10 more minutes. Well, th this is fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, quantum magic squares. So this is the facade of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And this is a magic square because every row and every column sums to 33. Um, imagine moreover, imagine now that you divide every number by 33, you would have then um, an un a real number say uh, between zero and one so that every row and every column sums to one. That, that is a magic square. What I haven't said is what is a quantum version of this, of a magic square. Okay, okay. what's a magic square? It's a square where every row and column describes a random variable. You want you can say it this way, right? So you can have a bunch of numbers. This sums to one, 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 this sums to one. But it's not not if I take all the rows, that, that, that would be a stack of random variables, but it's not any stack because something magical is kind of happening in the columns, right? So this column is also a random variable. Every column is also a random variable, okay? So it's a fancy kind of combination of a set of variables or random variables. Yeah. Yes, kind of magical. Okay. Um, what's a quantum thing? What's a, what's a quantum? Well, some people have defined it differently, but we defined it this way. Can I have a question concerning the, this matrices? <laughs> so usually when you have a matrix consisting of uh, like non-negative numbers, which sum like at all columns and rows sum up to, to the identity, it's like a bistochastic matrix, no? Yeah, it's called a doubly stochastic matrix. Yeah, right? doubly stochastic or bistochastic. So what's the difference between this and uh, quantum, I mean, magic squares? Why it's there is no difference, but you have to agree with me that magic square sounds a lot more okay. attractive than okay, okay. doubly stochastic matrices. Okay. In fact, I have to tell you something. This paper was just like a divertimento, okay? Like it wasn't like our main line of research. Yeah. And um, I don't know why several people wrote like, um, like, uh, art, like newspaper pieces about this. And we were very surprised. Like people suddenly paid attention to that. Instead, we, we were super proud of our Omega Shi thing. And, Everyone is ignoring that paper. It got rejected from I don't know how many journals and so on. And I think it's just because in the title there's quantum magic squares. Really, I cannot think of any other reason. Anyway, okay. So here, every row and column describes a, a measurement, a POVM. Okay. So every element of this quantum magic square is a S times S matrix, positive semi-definite, so that their sum is the identity matrix. So you must agree with me that this is like, okay, so this is like a magical combination of NPOVMs, because not any combination will, will give rise to a magic square, right? A quantum magic square, right? And you must agree with me that going from magic square to quantum magic square is like, moving in that um, uh, that universe that we saw at the beginning, right? Moving like from level one to some higher level, right? In level one, we every such positive semi-definite matrix is just a non-negative number that sums to the number one. In this case, it sums to the identity. Yeah, yeah. Here I was trying to imagine a magic square as a fancy composition rule. So I tried to use this symbol, but I think this is very hard to, it's very hard to imagine, but it's something like a magic square is something happening at level one and then quantum magic square is its promotion to quantum, okay? Every local term is promoted to a positive semi-definite matrix, which is the, a non-commutative version of a non-negative number. Now, every so mean, I guess that taking the trace or something like this of a kind of is this what you mean? Like when you when you have a P of M and then when you try uh, 
take the trace of effects of P of M and you renormalize, you recover the classical magic square or something. Right? Um, I think it can be more general than taking the trace. It can consist of contracting with a V V star and then summing over such Vs. Okay. Yeah, that's called, so the opposite of that is called like the matrix convex hull. And it's defined in the paper. And that's something that was considered by people doing non-commutative algebraic geometry like Tim. Yeah. Okay, now every magic square is a convex combination of n deterministic variables. This is the, this is the famous Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. No, what is it called? Birkhoff? No, what's it? It's Birkhoff von Neumann. I, I always knew it as Birkhoff theorem, but I, is it von Neumann? No, who is the second name? Now I'm confused. You know what? You know the theorem, right? It's just Birkhoff, or what is it? I think it's Bir yeah. Birkhoff, just Birkhoff. Yeah, but sometimes it's called Birkhoff von Neumann. Anyway, I think that's super well known and it's great. This is great. Just great, great theorem. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fact number two, number one. Now, fact number two. Okay, maybe I just add, so I checked Wikipedia and it's called Birkhoff von Neumann. Okay, great, yeah. I'm, I was confused because von Neumann sounds very quantum to me, but uh, in this case, it's just purely classical, yeah. Okay, now, second fact. Every measurement can be dilated to a projective measurement. That's the beauty of the purification. That's, that's like saying that every mixed state can be purified. That's the same thing, but for in the dual picture, if you want. Of, yeah. That's something very mysterious too. We should talk about that one day because you know there are projective measurements, pure states. These things do not exist. These things are only in an ideal world, but they play such an important role, like even, even mathematically, right? We kind of underpin the description of of the of mixed states and of, of, of POVMs. I find this very weird. Uh, yeah, what does dilated mean? Dilated means that you can embed it in a larger dimensional system and which is pure. Kind of means that. But in this case, it means that it contains projectors. Okay. Okay. Now these two things, oh that's called the Stein spring dilation theorem. Now, these two things lead to the following question. Can every quantum magic square be dilated to a quantum permutation matrix, which is like a quantum magic square, but where every entry is a projector? Okay. This is the quantum version of the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. And this works for every row of the quantum magic square by Stein spring dilation theorem but it may not work for the whole quantum magic square because the dilation needs to work for the rows and the columns simultaneously. And the answer is no, which oh, is- Just, uh, Jana, can I, okay, yeah. please, I don't want to, I didn't want to interrupt, but yeah. Uh, okay, That's so just, just the, the basic version of this question would be asking the same, uh, you know, I, you know, I, Personally, I play a lot with projective me uh, simulating uh, measurements by projective measurements, stuff like that, right? So, like the basic question to, uh, that one can ask, and I, but I guess the answer would be the same: would be when you don't do dilation, but if you start from a uh, from uh, magic square that you defined, and like can you present it via, uh, you know, without dilation via convex combination of uh, like. POVMs, uh, projective measurements, it seems. Like, would it be, does it make sense what I'm saying? Or Yeah, no, the answer is no. I mean, sure. the dilation in particular could be trivial. Sure, sure. Yeah, so in some sense, this is a combination of these two results. But what you can do in the classical case, in level one, and what you can do for every row of uh, PO of the quantum magic square, Yeah, and the answer is no, which I think is, it should be seen in a positive way. It should be seen as saying that quantum magic squares contain many more things than magic squares are much more difficult to characterize. It's like another world. And actually this happens already if the internal dimension is two by two. So in the simplest non-trivial case. 
And why not? Well, because of some fancy things from Tim and, and Tom that I shared about, because this is all connected to like free spectra hydra and stuff like that. Oh yeah, actually we have more. It says, the only quantum magic squares that can be dilated to a commuting quantum permutation matrix are the so-called semi-classical. That is of the form a sum over a permutation matrix times a PSD matrix. So that's like putting like the same PSD matrix in several places in a permutation, summing over them. And only this can be dilated to a commuting quantum permutation matrix. So that's like a full characterization that we have in the paper. But in the general case, the answer is no. Okay, maybe that's enough. Ah, we also gave like an invitation to all of this topic in this paper with Tim, which is a, it's written in a very, I, I hope in a more inviting language to, to start thinking about these things. Okay, and finally, some shadows of infinity. That's a recent work with Mirte, who is a student. Uh, it's great fun to work with her and Tim. Okay, so now be with me for the following minutes. That's a little, it's a little technical. Okay, a map P, I'm, I'm trying to define tender stable positive, okay? Now a map P is positive if it maps the cone of PSD matrices to itself. A map P is tender stable positive if P tender N is positive for all N. So P tender N acts on the N-fold tender product of the universes and lands in the n-fold tender product of the universes. And there is some cone, some big cone in here. And this cone must be mapped to, the, to itself, to the cone, so that, because p tender n must be positive. This is the definition of tender stable positive. This was introduced to study NPT bound entanglement by Mila Hermes Plato. Ah, okay, well, positive is very hard to characterize. Ah, what we wanted to prove was that this was undecidable. We got halfway. <laughs> uh, but actually, this led to another project on which we are working, which is on investigating when bounding a problem let, lets you go from um, undecidable to NP complete. Because this is the case, for example, for the halting problem, for the PCP problem, for many problems, there is the case that bounding goes from RE complete to NP, com NP complete. And ultimately we want to apply this to the problem of tender stable positive. What do you mean by bounding, like bounding the size yeah. or? Yes, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a crucial question. You know the halting problem, right? It's like given a description of P and an X, that's P halt on X. This problem is RE complete. It's, it's semi-decidable, it's undecidable. If you say given a description of P and an X and a number N, does P hold on N on at most N steps? This is, sure, sure. Um, now I'm not sure if it's co-NP or NP, something like that, but, but that's, that's bounding. Or another example is our uh, NPO positivity problem, where we are given a, a local tensor and we are asked, does this give rise to a positive semi-definite um, matrix when you concatenate it N times for all N? This is undecidable. But if you ask, does it give rise to something positive, something definite for all, um, and for a given n? Okay, now I'm confused about. I think it's co np. It's in co np instead of np. Yeah. So bounding is like there's some sort of natural bounding procedure in the problem. Another example is yeah, PCP. If you've heard of that, it's like a domino problem. Uh, on like this matrix mortality problem comes from the domino problem. And that also bounding gives gives rise to like NP. And bounding is the, is the direction that the, the problem is how to unbound in general, because it's not well defined. Yeah. Okay, now completely positive maps, possibly followed by a transposition, are tensor stable positive. These are the so-called trivial examples of things that satisfy this. These are if they are followed by a transposition, they are called co-completely positive. The central question is, is there anything else? Are there other so-called essential tensor-stable positive maps? Well, they call them non-trivial. We call them essential because 
it sounds like that the essence is in the halo and so on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because if the answer is yes, then it follows that there are NPT bound entangled states. This is proven in this paper. Okay. Now we investigate this question from two angles. Are there essential tender stable positive maps? Angle one, undecidability. We prove the following. Consider this bunch of bell pairs. This is called a matrix multiplication tender sometimes, like from I1 to I2 and so on. Okay. We call it chi n. We show that if you are if you're given p, it is undecidable whether p tends or n apply to this state. This is a pure state. This is positive semi-definite in particular, it's one one. And the question is whether the result will be positive semi-definite or not. And the theorem says it's undecidable whether this will be positive semi-definite or not. Conjecture. Given n, given p, it is undecidable whether p tends or n is positive for all n. And we also show that if the conjecture is true, then there exist, there must exist essential tender stable positive maps, and therefore NPT bound entanglement. However, we would arrive at this conclusion in a non-constructive way, so we wouldn't be able to construct them. But it would be useful to prove that it's undecidable, also like as a proof technique. Okay, angle two, the hypercomplex. Now that's the most surrealist part of the talk. Okay, now you're very tired and now comes the weirdest part. All right. Okay, so quantum theory over the complex numbers is something like that, right? Like there's a real and an imaginary part, but now over the hypercomplex numbers, there's a hyper real and a hyper imaginary part, which in particular you can imagine as if every number would glow and that there's this glowing here. Right? Because now I will tell you what that it means to glow. It glows in the hyper complex, okay? And this glowing is the key for our results, okay? So, all right. So, I'm trying to justify that the hyper reals are not as crazy as you think, although they, will, they look really crazy. Okay. First, the integers or something like that. And um, why am I, yeah, I know why I'm saying that because every integer is an equivalence class of a pair of naturals. So that's it's a pretty non obvious way, like, so that their subtraction is the, every rational is an equivalence class of pairs of integers. Every real is an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences of rationals that go to that real, tend to that real. And every hyper real is an equivalence class of sequences of real numbers. Okay. Okay, but first I wanna, okay, and this equivalence class is defined like with a hype ultra filter. But let me let me first say something to tease your um, um, motivation and, and, and to make you reveal against all of your intuitions. There is something in between a real number that is arbitrarily close to zero and the number zero. And this thing is a hyper real, okay? Namely, it is the, it's called an infinitesimal. And it's like the equivalence class of the sequence one, one half, one third, one fourth, blah, 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 blah. This is an infinite sequence that tends to zero. It is a number or it is an element of the hyper reals. It is strictly larger than zero, but at the same time, um, strictly smaller that, than any real number that is arbitrarily close to zero. So it's something you can imagine like as follows. If you have the real number zero in the hyper reals, you can zoom in and you'll have infinitely many infinitesimals in that, around that thing. And this thing is called the halo. It's really called the halo. We didn't make up this name. It's called the halo of zero. The numbers at a finite distance are called the galaxy of the number, but this thing is called a halo. This is the glowing I mentioned earlier. Okay, there are all these like tiny things around the, the zero, which are invisible in the reals. They are just zero. Okay, and by symmetry, let me mention that at the same time, all the reals are just so, something which are inside the zero kind of 
or so, so let me put it differently. There is something in between a real number that is arbitrarily large and infinity, namely an unlimited hyperreal like this sequence. It's smaller than infinity, but larger than any real. Anyway, okay. So what we show is that there exist essential tensor stable positive maps in the hypercomplex. So it follows that there exist and there exists NPT bound entangled states in the hypercomplex. So because the halo of some trivial tensor stable positive maps contains essential tensor stable positive maps. So the main thing I want to the question I want to raise here to all of you is why do we use why do we do quantum mechanics over the complex instead of the hypercomplex? I mean the hypercomplex are crazy, but so are the complex. So I, I think it would be interesting to study the hypercomplex from a foundational perspective. So just you glance over, I mean, you like spend limited amount of time, which is natural <laughs> on the, the like defining and motivating those hyperreals and so on. But so do they form, I guess they don't like, so they if form a field. And they form a complete ordered field. If this ultra filter, which I didn't define, which lets you define this equivalence class is non-principal. And, and as it, that's, a, that's a definition. You can, it, it means that it contains all confinement set. There's some very- and You can do linear algebra with them or something. You can do all regular algebra. You can have matrices over, that's what we do. Matrices over the hyper complex. Mm -hmm. You can diagonalize matrices. You can take the determinant. You can define positive semi-definiteness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. So just, but what, let's say, okay, okay, this is maybe, I remember that when you, when you do somehow sometimes weird numbers, you like, maybe there were some, maybe these were happy reals, maybe not, like when you do, I know, Belden locality, you can actually maybe uh, violate CHSH with uh, hidden variables, but like, or like there were some results like this, right? When you take weird numbers, I, that that was my. Do anyway, you mean, do you mean our the kind of hypercomplex here, or like quaternions? Because they are. No, I don't mean quater. No, I don't mean quaternions. Anyway, I don't know what I'm talking. To. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I shut up. I think. Sorry. Well, if you want to learn about that, this book is very nice. Um, I like it. Anyway, um, yeah, so it really made me think. So first I thought, it's crazy to consider a, a hyper real number. But then I thought, well, it's crazy to consider a, a real number anyway. So, so why not? And OK, I, this result shows that some of these famous and all standing problems in quantum info can be solved there over the hyper complex. Yeah, unfortunately, the halo disappears in the complex, so we cannot say anything about the original problem. OK, I'm way over time, but I've tried to shed some light on um, some aspects of quantum theory, like uh, from the whole to the part, the shadows of infinity and magic squares by intertwining um, some actors or actresses of the theory, like non-commutativity, the tensor product, positive elements, and the complex numbers. And in from the whole to the parts, we propose the framework to describe the compositions of tensor product spaces with invariance, positivity, and approximations, and applied it to quantum many body systems and polynomials. And we are currently extending this work to border ranks. And but we'd like to go, I'd like to really go to the size invariant framework, which may connect to a question that I think Misha, Michal or someone raised earlier about the infinite sizes. It could be generalized as Q-symmetries. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the approximations. In magic squares, we have defined quantum magic squares and found that they are, I forgot a word. I forgot three words. I found that they are harder to characterize than classical magic squares. Oh, there was this very recent paper or from last year from um, Tchaikovsky and some other people uh, on the, the absolutely maximal entangled state that's beautiful. Um, and it, it's not, uh, they are a particular kind of quantum magic squares and it's unclear what their result means for us. Nothing immediately, it seems, but um, it's so beautiful, their result that um, I should have uh, cited it, um, yeah. And uh, there's a very nice quantum magazine article about it for explaining it in, in plain words. And we were also trying to go in the direction of magic cubes. 
just for fun. Yeah, and Shadows of Infinity about tender stable positivity. Uh, we showed that the problem, uh, like determining whether a map is positive on the MAMU tensor, MAMU means matrix multiplication is undecidable, and conjecture that deciding whether a map is tender stable positive is undecidable. And over the hypercomplex, there exist essential tensor stable pos positive maps in the hypercomplex, and also NPD1 entangled states in the hypercomplex. And I wanna, how reasonable, how crazy is it to do quantum theory over the hypercomplex? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, which infinities are we willing to accept in a theory? I think that's ultimately the question. Okay. Ah, what's the scope of, sorry, I didn't remember <laughs> all of that. What's the scope of undecidability in physics? That is a question I really love and on which I'm very unclear. Okay, thanks. Thanks, I'm sorry for going so much over time. Oh my goodness, I've been talking for so long. Sorry. No, don't worry, don't worry. So thanks, Gemma, for this interesting talk. It was full of uh, new stuff for me and the others as well, I guess. Uh, so do you have any questions? I have one question. Okay, go ahead, Mia. So tough. Okay, that is on the foundational side, sorry. Uh, but in the first part, when you were talking about the, those omega tensor decompositions, right? So I, I guess one can view this, uh, this way of presenting objects in tensor product spaces as a generalization somehow of uh, tensor network formalism, right? So uh, do you, okay, do you, like uh, the set formalism was kind of uh, derived uh, like to somehow effectively describe some many body, as you were, well, not like to describe, uh, let's say, many body states efficiently or some classes of them, right? So, like, can one get some kind of benefits over tensor network states when one, let's say, do like what when one tries to do those more general uh, omega complexes, right? With some still maybe notions of locality and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I I see it. I ask the opposite question in some sense. Namely, from all the knowledge of tensor networks, can one um, learn new things about more general decompositions? And the answer is yes. For example, we know that um, if you have a state that is translationally invariant, in general, it does not admit a translational invariant decomposition. Um, the bond dimension needs to grow as square root of n. And that was something that was proven in the context of tensor networks and now can be exported to tensor decomposition. I am a bit um, skeptical or maybe not very optimistic toward learning new things about tensor networks from our more general perspective, because I think the whole point of tensor networks is that they are so special and one should exploit these um, distinguished properties of 1D or 2D things and so on. And, mm -hmm. and what we're doing is going away from these distinguished properties. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, but they have definitely kind of inspired our generalization. And I think this entire connection with the CP, the CPSD, uh, the, all of these decompositions is, but our work is like a non-commutative generalization of all of their work. This work was done by Monique Lovan and other people from Amsterdam and Hamza Fauzi and all of these people. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I mainly see the use of our work in this direction as a non commutative generalizations of things that, that, that exist and as borrowing results from tensor networks to that, uh, to that other world. Uh, sure. But uh, maybe I'm wrong and I just don't know. I think tensor networks is so weak these days that... Right, right. I don't even know exactly what, what precisely... If you have something in mind, I could try to be more specific, but... Sure, I mean, okay, I don't want to maybe take time of, uh, <laughs> of everybody, so I, I might have some follow-up questions, but I like email you and like maybe contact okay. you uh, by other words. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So maybe someone else uh, has a question. 
Okay, so maybe I can ask something. Uh, so can you go back to this? Uh, can we go back to this quantum magic squares? Yeah. Okay, so you said that they, so how it was that they cannot be, so if you have such a uh, quantum magic square, it cannot be purified to a permutation matrix. Yep. So, but this this would correspond to like having, so this, this would correspond to like replacing every P of M with a projective measurement? Yeah. Okay. In a larger dimensional space. Okay, okay. But maybe it's possible, for instance, okay, so this matrix uh, is composed of two N uh, P of EMs. Yeah. But maybe at least some of them can be purified or something, like yeah. you know, all columns or. Yeah, yeah, every, all rows and all columns separately. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And so, what's, so for instance, if you have the simplest example, like of having uh, four, POVMs, okay, to, for two outcome POVMs. So what's the reason that you cannot uh, purify it, purify them or more or less? I mean, what's the intuition? Uh, very unfortunately, I don't have an intuition. Okay. I don't have an intuition. I mean, all I can say is that if the POVM is of this form, I'm uh, sorry, if the quantum magic square is of this form, mm -hmm. Which is, for example, imagine that here and uh, you replace, yeah, exactly. Imagine that you replace little p1 by a positive semi definite matrix. And also little p2 by another positive semi definite matrix for, mm -hmm. so that they sum to the identity. That would give rise to a quantum magic square. It's the simplest example. Yes. Well, this one is good, like it's an easy one. Mm -hmm. This is called, uh, well, we call it semi-classical because it's, yeah, it's like a, it's precisely like a permutation, just a classic a permutation matrix times a positive semi-definite matrix. And this one can be dilated to um, even a commuting quantum permutation matrix, which means that the elements, mm -hmm. the entries commute. But in general, the reason is uh, quite abstract and follows from some results from team and Tobias Fritz and so on that they had previously. And unfortunately, I don't have any intuition. Okay. I, sorry, I'm, I find this disappointing because I always ask for intuitions and I'm very disappointed. In that. So sorry for asking this question. No, I like your question, yeah. Um, and so can you, can you also say what would be the connection between this quantum magic, magic squares and absolutely maximally untangled states? I think that first of all, if you put this absolutely maximal entangled state in a matrix, um, they would correspond to like um, a quantum magic square where every um, entry is of rank one. Like it's not only a projector, but it is of rank one, first of all. And not only that, but they have some additional conditions, like they come from this. Um, Latin Greco squares, mm -hmm. which are like formed like as a pair of uh, two different sets. So it's not even an arbitrary rank one thing, but, 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 it, but it has some additional conditions. And we haven't, that would be an interesting kind of follow-up work from, from our work. Like what happens if you consider a quantum permutation matrix of rank one, or like where everything is rank one. By the way, I should have mentioned that um, Laura Manchinska and other people had been uh, investigating quantum permutation matrices uh, with a different definition thereof. I think um, they cared about quantum graphs and like the quantum isomorphism problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had like a different definition. Okay. Any other question, Michal? Michal has a lot of questions for sure. Uh, may I have a question, actually? Because uh, for a second you talked about the approximate Cartier-Dori theorem, so yeah. I only heard about the like regular Cartier-Dori theorem. So could you elaborate about how the two differ? Yeah, it, it's very different. The, this approximate Cartier-Dori theorem it tells you that if you have um, you have a set of points in a given vector space, and you consider their convex hull, okay, and you wanna um, uh, you want to describe um, an element within this convex hull. Then this element in the convex hull, hull can be written as a sum of 
k of these points. And the difference will only like will only go like one over k, like, um, where like k is the number of terms. So in particular, this is independent of the dimension of the vector space where these points live. Okay, that's Sorry. interesting. So so like you don't have to consider dimension in the approximate theorem? No, it's completely different. It's a bit misleading. I guess it was proven by the same person. I'm not sure. But um, it's it's different than the than the standard ones, and there are some recent. There's a recent paper by Ivanov and others, and Adi Prosito and others. I'm sorry that I didn't cite them here. Um, improving and using this approximate Cartesian theorem. Um, the references are are in our paper. Oh, okay, so yeah, I never heard of this before. Oh. And yeah. Ask, so, so the, the idea is that you, rather than exactly expressing a point as a convex hull, uh, as a convex combination by points from this discrete set, you you take at most you upper bound the number of yeah. terms that you take, and still under some conditions you can upper bound the error in some norm via yeah. a function of the like how many terms you are taking. Yeah. Sounds right. quite powerful and interesting. Yeah. It yeah. Goes it's like, cool, yeah. One over k or one over k squared. I don't remember now. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe we finish now because I guess Gemma is uh, already tired. So thank you, Gemma, uh, once more for your talk. It was very interesting. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sorry that I went so much over time. No, don't worry. Don't worry. It was very interesting. <laughs>